there's a car company that's getting bigger and it also believes its newest vehicle proves it's getting better. That's this week on Motoring 2002. SN's Motoring 2002 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas. This is a Pelican case, hard as a rock on the outside, protecting everything on the inside. And this is a knapsack, as we all know, useful for carrying things including an umbrella in case it rains. So tell me something I don't know you're saying. Well, would you believe these two items were the inspiration for the industry's newest sport utility? And they call it the Pilot. Back in 1995, Honda the car maker saw the potential, as in potential dollars, in the truck market and built the Odyssey. The company quickly realized the van was too small made the necessary modifications, and today the Odyssey continues to set the standard. Next up was the CRV, followed by the luxury MBX from Acura. Now it would seem that Honda had all the bases covered, but apparently not. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2003 Honda Pilots. We've taken the same approach for many years. We've, we've taken a look at the market decided where there were potential gaps or opportunities in the market for us to take advantage of from a product standpoint and then built that product that we thought would fill that gap or that need for our customers. And the Pilot is a prime example of that where we saw a need in the intermediate SUV segment and brought the product to market. The Odyssey was filling some of the gap for us in the Honda channel, but still Overall, we're losing about 9% of our total Honda vehicle customers to this compact and intermediate SUV category. So we needed to find some sort of a stopgap to, to keep those customers in the Honda channel. That's why we created the Pilot. It looks like a bigger CRV, but it's based on the MDX. Uh, tell me about the. Well, I, th I think if you put them side by side, the CRV and the Pilot look significantly different. Um, it is based on the MDX, but Again, the MDX is targeting towards luxury SUVs. It's all about image. It's all about prestige. It's very important for the mainstream customer, and as we said earlier, it's very important to differentiate the luxury SUV owner from the mainstream customer. One way to do that is by styling. The powertrain is a 3.5 liter uh, SOHC V6 engine, VTEC capable with a two and a three rocker system to optimize fuel filling efficiency. It's married up to a five-speed automatic transmission, and it utilizes the same four-wheel drive technology as the Acura MDX, which is the VTM4 system. But what does a Pelican case and knapsack have to do with the Pilot? It's uh, the world's most indestructible case. Um, the military uses it, and the exterior is extremely durable and rugged, yet the interior is uh, very soft and padded and protects its contents. That was the theme for the exterior of the vehicle. The interior theme was a backpack. We picked that because it's very rugged and durable, and yet it's kind of uh, expandable. And it's got stuffable storage and netting and all that stuff. And those themes were, were uh, used on the interior of the vehicle itself. They don't go off-road, you're right. But they want the ability to go anywhere, anytime, any place. So this, this uh, four-wheel drive capability has to be capable of doing that. Now, one of the things that are very important for this customer is snow and ice capability, going to the ski resort, um, getting through to work in the morning after a heavy snowstorm. This four-wheel drive system is completely capable of attacking that sort of thing and any type of a medium-duty off-road trail to go camping with their family. Competition for Pilot would be uh, Explorer, um, would be Highlander, 
uh, those types of vehicles, and we find that our vehicle uh, stacks up and performs very well, not only from a, uh, a typical city driving scenario, but also in off-road capabilities. As more sport utilities become more car-like, more family-friendly, I think you're going to find that the segments will, uh, the intermediate segment in the SUV class will continue to grow. The Beatles sang about revolution. Well, I'm going to try one more time to start another one. That's later on Kenzie's Corner. This is the latest version of Audi's A4, but no ordinary A4 is this. It is, in fact, something they call the Avant. To you and I, however, we think of them as station wagons. Audi's new A4 Avant is an attractive package that blends gray space and pace. Take the engine, for example. While it doesn't look the part on paper, it has a surprisingly large can of whoop ass under the hood considering it's 1.8 litres. Turbocharging the twin cam 4 produces 170 horsepower and more importantly 166 pounds feet of torque anywhere between 1950 and 5000 rpm. The latter brings a pleasing turn of speed over a very broad range. Pushed to the max, the A4 Avant runs to 100 kilometres an hour in about 8 seconds and will bridge the 80 to 120 gap in about 7.5. One of the highlights of the A4 wagon is its quattro all-wheel drive system and its ability to keep the car moving even if only one wheel has got grip. Now, as with most systems, it's got a center differential that distributes the power to the front and rear wheels. What comes up here? If this wheel starts to spin, in most systems, it gets all of the power and you get stuck. With the quattro system, it uses the anti-lock brakes to slow this wheel, which forces the power to the other wheel, the one with grip, and so you keep going. Now, whilst that's a benefit in winter, it really doesn't do much for you in summer. What the system does do, however, is improve the dynamic balance of an already sure-footed car. The five-speed manual transmission that links the motor to the Quattro system is a slick shifter that brings the right ratios, a clean gate, and light clutch. Having said that, I would still pick the five-speed automatic with Tiptronic. This manumatic gives the best of both the driven and drive worlds, allowing the driver to control the shifts or sit back and let the box do the thinking. The anti-lock brake system that helps the Quattro drive so much also does a good job of stopping the A4. The pedal is firm and easily modulated, bringing stops that measured 112 feet from 80K. It is also a rarity that the anti-lock system not only works hand in hand with the all-wheel drive, but actually works well in spite of it. Many times the mechanical link between all four wheels forces a compromise. There is not one with the A4. Inside, the A4 has been very well thought through, for the most part. To begin with, you get a wonderful stereo that pumps out quality sound, tilt and telescopic steering, and these front seats, well, they're exceptionally comfortable and both heated. You also get heated seats in the rear. Then you get to a couple of real brain hiccups. First of all, this coffee cup holder it's a delightful piece of engineering, but completely useless. And this one, well, it's just too far back. Then you get to the speedo. Now, this really does defy logic. It starts off 5, 10, 15, 20. When you get to 80 kilometers an hour, they change the calibration to every 10. So consequently, it goes 80, 90, 100, and so on. Now, what that does is that between 90 and 110, it's difficult to tell exactly how fast you're going. It really does defy logic especially when you consider that they've got 260k on the clock, well, the car's limited to less than 210k. The Avant rides on multi-link suspensions front and rear with anti-roll bars at both ends. The resulting ride is clean and smooth while controlling the amount of body roll and understeer effectively, at least until you overpower the 215.55 R16 tyres. Through the pylons, the A4 behaved more like a sports car than a station wagon. 
Even cranking up the speed brought a balanced transition when weaving through the course. One of the items that helps here is the lighter engine. When compared to the 3-litre V6 version, the 1.8T has a much lighter, livelier feel. It is indeed a sporty package. The back end of the A4 has been very well thought through, primarily because the style is such, well, it doesn't look like you need a coffin in here. It's also got everything you expect of a wagon. Tie-down hooks, cargo net, <coughs> privacy shield to keep prying eyes off your stuff, as well as a net that keeps the dog or your parcels in the back rather than allowing them into the back seat. Then you get to the piece de resistance, as they say. Beneath the floor, and this thing here, you've got a full-size spare tire. Now, while most people don't look at a full-size spare as being a safety item, trust me, it is. A donut will take you roughly 80K at 80 kilometers an hour. This thing right here, it'll take you all the way home and at almost any speed you want. Just watch your license. The other items that round out an impressive safety list are next-generation front airbags, seat-mounted side airbags, and a pair of inflatable curtains that drop from the roof line. These are designed to keep the occupants inside the vehicle while keeping the debris out. A worthwhile option are the $490 side airbags for the rear seat riders. Add to that little lot quattro all-wheel drive, anti-lock brakes and traction control, and both the active and passive bases are covered very effectively. You know, Audi really did miss the boat when they named this vehicle. Rather than calling it the A4 Avant, they should have called it the A4 SUV because it's got more sporting ability than all of the traditional SUVs added up together, and it's got darn near as much utility. It really is a nice package, especially when you factor in that Quattro oil drive system. Our Midas Tip of the Week concerns washer fluids. A number of premium washer fluids are available on the market today, and some are specifically targeted to the time of year. I told you about this one last fall and how well it works in the winter time. Actually dissolves a light layer of frost on the windshield first thing in the morning before the heat of the defroster gets to the glass. Maximum freeze protection, and both these products offer Rain-X micropolymer technology that seals the micropores on your windshield glass and actually makes rainwater just slide off with the air pressure of the vehicle moving through the air. This one with the pink fluid is specifically designed for summer driving with more grease cutters in it to dissolve that grime and grease that you get on the windshield in the summertime and also the splatter from insects. Make sure that you have this one out in the fall because it doesn't have the freeze protection you need. However, both these products offer enhanced visibility in rough weather and that extra visibility equates to safety. They're well worth the extra money. That's your Midas Tip of the Week. For more information on past and future episodes of Motoring, log on to the Motoring website at motoringtv.com, where you can email your suggestions, questions, and comments, which are always welcome. That's motoringtv.com. friendly little fellow with a cheerful disposition and a wagging tail that kind of followed us home from last November's Tokyo Motor Show. It's a concept vehicle co-developed by Toyota and Sony to explore the potential for true two-way communication between car and driver. It's a car designed to be your partner to share your moods and be a part of your family. All of us have a personal relationship uh, with, with your automobile or your truck, and Pod kind of takes it to the next step, uh, where uh, some of the technology allows you to kind of communicate even closer with your car. A portable terminal called a, the Minipod serves as the vehicle's intelligence center. 
and plays a vital role in the growth of the relationship between the car and the driver. It's a car that can develop uh, you know, 10 different emotions from happy to crying to mad and uh, it learns a little bit about you, the driver, your habits uh, to kind of help you have a better relationship uh, with your automobile. Drive by wire, for example, which this car has, uh, and a joystick instead of uh, you know a steering wheel. So a joystick will allow you to steer, to accelerate, and stop uh, all with one control, and really with better reactions. Uh, you know, in the future, that may be uh, where we want to go. So it's kind of fun, but uh, a lot of the personalization in terms of music, your driving habits. Uh, being able to communicate with the car, or the car communicate with you, or with other cars, uh, is all things that uh, who knows what the future might bring. You know, the Honda Pilot, like most vehicles today, is giving off fewer and fewer emissions. And you know, in the not too distant future, the exhaust coming out of the futuristic tailpipe will actually be cleaner than the air we are breathing. But what do all these pollution control measures mean for the men and women that have to maintain these vehicles? Well, why don't we put that question to our man in the Quaker State garage, Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, you know, the traditional tune-up has literally gone by the wayside. At one time, people brought cars in spring and fall for tune-ups, but now you've got cars with spark plugs designed to last 160,000 kilometers in most cases. Air filters, 48 to 50,000 kilometers. That could be quite a few springs and falls before you have to bring it in for the first tune-up. Now we've got, with modern cars, the engine being run by a computer. The computer decides how much fuel to inject and when, what the spark timing should be, and it runs a number of output devices that keep the car in compliance with emission control specs. Now when the car doesn't run right and doesn't deliver proper fuel economy or drivability, we've got to use a device like this, a scan tool, to analyze the computer in the car look at all the inputs to it and find out where the problem is. One important input to a modern car that determines what the fuel economy and drivability will be on that car is the oxygen sensor. You may have one or more oxygen sensors on your vehicle depending on what model you're and what engine you've got. In any case, they live in an awful harsh environment, screwed into the exhaust manifold or exhaust pipe of the engine, so they have an awful tough job to do. Now this sensor produces a small voltage between 0.1 of a volt and 0.9 of a volt and it's constantly changing and it's the information from this sensor that allows the computer to fine tune the air fuel ratio. If it's too rich you waste fuel and you have high exhaust emissions you may even see black sooty smoke coming out the exhaust. If it's too lean the engine stumbles or stalls and doesn't have power and this sensor is extremely critical to fuel economy. So if you bring a vehicle in with a fuel economy complaint and the mechanic checks the spark plugs, air filter, plug wires, etc., and doesn't find a problem, this is one of the important sensors you want to look at. You're going to use a scan tool like this one to analyze the output from that sensor and if the sensor is defective or out of spec, you're going to replace it. The sensors are costly, $70 to $150 depending on the vehicle. So you want to make sure before you change it that there is actually something wrong with it. But if, it's, if, it's, if it needs replacing, believe me, you'll probably waste fuel uh, that will account for the value of this sensor in six to eight months if you're driving around with a bad one. So if you need it replaced, get it replaced and you're going to save fuel and you're going to help emission control. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2002. McCartney was the cute beetle. He was the nice looking one. Even moms like Paul McCartney. And in his latter years, he and his sadly deceased wife, Linda, well, they became friends of the earth, vegetarians, peace, love, and tofu. Well, you know, he can still rock and roll, too. I was at his concert recently in Toronto. Man, that guy can really go. But Paul, all the save the earth stuff. One thing I don't understand is that outside the concert hall, there were about 30 transport truck tractors with the engines running. 
Now, they all belong to some company in Chicago, presumably being used to haul the equipment around. But they were just sitting there idling. And it wasn't like they had trailers on the back with refrigerator units keeping the beer cold for after the show. Most of them didn't have trailers on them at all. It wasn't like they were keeping the cabs warm for the drivers. There were no drivers in them. They left them running, locked them up, and walked away. What are they doing? Worse still, sometimes you see guys at, at truck stops in the wintertime with the engines idling overnight so the cabs won't get cold. Come on, guys. There's lots of cheaper ways to do it. You get a little auxiliary engine, runs all that stuff. No problem. Every truck engine manufacturer in the world tells their customers, shut them off. You're ruining the engine. Forget about ruining the atmosphere. And Mercedes-Benz showed research about 10 years ago that you can shut an engine off and switch it back on 30 times a minute and still use less fuel than if you idle for that minute. Why are they doing this? I don't understand. Now, Toronto even has an anti-idling bylaw. What, a cop is going to give a ticket to Paul McCartney? I don't think so. But I don't understand why they're doing this. We got to find a way. Maybe we print up brochures and slide them under the windshield wipers. Please, for the sake of all of us, turn your motor off. And when we do come up with a way, we got to roll over John Lennon and tell McCartney the news. I'm Jim Kent. Now, while very few people who dispute the quality of a Honda, in fact, our Bill Gardner owns a Civic, and he likes to call them bulletproof. On a recent J.D. Power survey that looked at the number of complaints per 100 vehicles for the model year 2001, while Honda was still well below the industry average, the company had gone up in the complaints department. You got to wonder if this survey is simply a symptom of the fact that Honda and Acura are building a lot more vehicles. Well, Honda says absolutely not. This is simply a blip on the radar screen. A few final thoughts on the new pilot. I think they've nailed it. So does Honda. They think this vehicle will be very painful on the competition. And somewhere around here is Graham Fletcher. He's checking out the nuts and bolts. We'll get his result and his opinion on a future test drive. Make sure you join us for that as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. With the Civic, it will blend with the others, and people will now feel that, you know, the hybrid vehicle does work and can work, and it can work also uh, during the winter. TSN's Motoring 2002 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas.